First on our agenda today is Senate File 58. And we do have the lead author of uh, Senate File 58, Senator Aaron Murphy, to join us today and to present the bill. Welcome, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. It is good to be with you uh, this afternoon for this proposal. And I understand, Senator Murphy, that you have an author's amendment that we should um, perhaps tend to first. Uh, Madam Chair, I do have the A1 amendment, which is my author's amendment. And this is an amendment uh, that puts the bill into the proper order uh, and it conforms with the fiscal note uh, that you have in your packets. Very good. Um, do I have um, one of our members who would move the author's amendment, the A1 author's amendments? Thank you. Senator Housechild moves um, to moves the A1 amendment. Um, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Murphy, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I am uh, delighted to be with you this afternoon, uh, and I'm grateful to be able to present Senate File 58, a bill to protect worker safety in Minnesota warehouses with a common sense requirement that companies notify warehouse workers of any quotas that they are expected to meet and provide their workers with access to data and how they're performing against those quotas. My dad, Bernie Murphy, he's still alive. Uh, my dad went back to school when I was in second grade using the GI Bill and he studied occupational health and safety. Uh, my dad was an auto worker and he grew up on a farm, two different kinds of work that are dangerous. And he chose uh, to study occupational health and safety and use that degree, his uh, leadership within his union and public policy to protect the workers at that GM plant that's now closed in Janesville, Wisconsin. My chosen career, nursing, is also known for many workplace injuries. Whether it is uh, back injuries, needle stick injuries, blood-borne injuries, we have, um, as policymakers and with our collective voices in a union, work to make sure that we are handling safe, patients safely to protect nurses' backs uh, and to make sure that the equipment is in place to make sure that nurses are able to continue to practice their profession and care safely for their patients. It has been this intersection of pol public policy and workplace standards, which is a tradition in America that has made sure that what is often the dangers at work are protected so that our workers are able to do their jobs, do them well, do them safely, um, and to fight against what can sometimes be uh, the rigor of productivity and profit that can put patients at risk and people at risk. America's very existence is built on the labor of workers and in too many ways the exploitation of workers. That is why unions are so critical, and that is why our work to create standards in the workplace to advance worker safety together is so necessary. Today, we will hear both expert testimony and stories from workers describing their experiences of working a grueling, relentless pace with quotas set by algorithms that treat people too often like robots and not like human beings. And the problem is only getting worse with new data from 2021, we've seen that injuries have risen 10% from the already staggering high rates of injuries. Soon you will hear the stories from workers as they will join me and share their firsthand experiences. And I hope and I know that you will listen to their stories about the need for the safety that we are offering in this proposal. Their stories will offer the opportunity to learn about the practices and models that are leading the exorbitantly high levels of worker injury and astronomical worker turnover. And it will offer the opportunity for us to act by supporting this provision to require transparency and information so workers can keep themselves and their coworkers safe. Production and profit cannot be licensed for worker injury. And when there's a problem, we must act together. All Minnesota workers deserve to be safe and respected in the workplace, no matter where you work, who you work for, or what your background is. 
but that's not the experience of warehouse workers in Amazon's Minnesota warehouses. And instead, workers do report being forced to work at a grueling pace under intense electronic surveillance and with the threat of discipline. Workers push themselves to the brink to meet quotas and time off task measures, which are often challenging and changing and not often even disclosed to the workers. And workers report not having enough time to take a break to eat or to use the bathroom because of the relentless pace and the size of the warehouses in which they work. As the National Employment Law Project report and updated data reflects, this has led to an injury rate that is 1.5 times the injury rate of non-Amazon warehouses in Minnesota and three times the injury rate in private industry. This data is alarming and the workers' experiences are alarming. They describe a culture of harmful surveillance and discipline practices at Amazon warehouses in Minnesota. If workers can't meet their high quotas, they don't keep pace. They are penalized or fired. They are replaced with new employees and the cycle that turns workers in and out at a rate nearly twice that of other Minnesota warehouses starts all over again. When we as lawmakers hear from workers and read reports about injury rates at a single company that are 1.5 times higher than others in this industry, we should take notice, we should ask questions, and we should listen to the, what the workers are telling us. And when the workers reached out for help, we responded and drafted this bill that protects worker safety in Minnesota warehouses. This warehouse worker safety bill, Senate File 58, is a modest and common sense bill that simply requires warehouse companies to notify their workers of any quotas, they'll be disciplined or fired if they fail to meet them, and then allows the workers to request access to that performance data transparency. It protects workers' existing legal rights by ensuring any quota or performance standard won't interfere with that worker's legal rights to take a break for meals, to use the restroom, and to pray. It gives the Department of Labor and Industry the ability to enforce the provisions and to open up an investigation into any company with injury rates higher than 30% the average for warehouses into violations of this provision. And it ensures that workers have the power to enforce the provisions. This legislation will ensure warehouse workers have the information they need to keep themselves safe and their coworkers safe. It's a common sense way to help create a safer and more sustainable workplace for these workers. And Madam Chair, I have testifiers. I'd be happy to turn this back to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Senator Murphy. Uh, let's go ahead and proceed. I believe that we have um, testifier Irene uh, Tung, is, am I pronouncing that correctly, on Zoom appearing with That's us? That's correct, yes, thank you. Hello, Ms. Tung. Um, welcome to the Senate Labor Committee. Um, we're just, there you are. We have you set up now so we can see you and we can hear you. Welcome. Um, and with that, I will um, turn it over to you and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. And thank you to uh, Chair McEwen and the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Irene Tong. I am a senior researcher and policy analyst at the National Employment Law Project. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and advocacy organization specializing in employment policy. I'm testifying in support of Senate File 58, which would provide critical regulation of the growing warehouse industry in Minnesota as warehouse employers such as Amazon expand their operations in the state. Over the last three years, I've studied Amazon's workplace practices across the country including in Minnesota, and I'm the lead author of a report published in 2021 on the wide-ranging human costs of Amazon's presence in Minnesota. Since that report was published, we now have access to new data showing that the situation has gotten even worse at Amazon in Minnesota. As Senator Murphy mentioned, uh, between 2020 and 2021, injuries actually rose 10% at Minnesota Amazon facilities including at the Shakopee Fulfillment Center, which already had astronomically high rates of injury. Uh, Minnesota, Minnesota Amazon workers are injured at a rate equivalent to more than one injury for every 10 full-time workers. And that's more than one and a half times the rate of non-Amazon workers in warehousing and logistics in Minnesota, three times the rate of other private sector workers in Minnesota, 
and almost double the rate of uh, the average rate of injury in warehouses nationally. One moment. So I can't emphasize enough that the injuries that we're talking about here, these are serious muscle strain injuries caused by rapid repetitive motions without sufficient recovery time. They are not only painful, but are often disabling and can stay with workers their entire lives. All of these injuries were serious enough to require medical attention. That's why they were recorded. And the vast majority, 89%, were cases so severe that workers could not continue performing their normal job duties and had to either be transferred to a different job or take time off work to recover. As regulators such as Washington State OSHA have noted, the high rates of injuries at Amazon are directly attributable to the way that the company manages its workforce. It's Amazon's obsession with speed, enforced through a combination of intensive electronic surveillance and frequent discipline that has created this injury crisis for workers. Amazon fosters a climate of fear in which workers have to push their bodies to the brink or risk losing their jobs. And when Amazon temporarily suspended these policies in 2020 during the pandemic, injury rates went way down, showing that these injuries are 100% preventable. Passing Senate File 58 is a crucial first step in addressing the harmful management practices at Amazon. Most importantly, this bill establishes transparency in quotas and prohibits employers from using quotas to prevent workers from taking rest breaks as provided for under state law. And I also want to emphasize that this is not only about Amazon. Amazon is, you know, has developed these uh, technologies and has developed these practices, and they are actively marketing uh, and spreading their management practices and technologies um, to, other, to other companies, um, both in the warehousing industry and beyond. So I urge you to support this important legislation. Thank you for your attention and consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Tome. And um, just for the record, I should have asked you uh, at the beginning, um, could you just for the record let us know where you're testifying from? Sure, I am in New York City. Thank you very much, much appreciated. Um, and next on our list of testifiers, we have um, Kali Jama. Welcome, Ms. Jama. And um, next on deck, just so people are ready, uh, we will have Mohammed Hassan with an interpreter um, also. Um, so if those people could be ready after we hear from um, Ms. Jama. Welcome, Ms. Jama, to the Senate Labor Committee. We look forward to hearing your testimony. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> My name is Kali Jama. I am one of the co um, Amazon co workers. I've been working at Amazon less than a year. And I'm um, just working there. I just have never in my life experienced what I experienced working there. Like um, they were saying, the race, they want you to work in certain speed where certain people cannot work in that speed. Um, managers will come and harass you and tell you your rate is down. Um, they don't care if you're sick. They don't care if you're not feeling well. They just send you to a place called MCARE, which they don't do much for you. Um, the HR there don't do anything because they always say their hands are tight. So it's just been going a lot. And um, recently I received the news about the OSHA in California where they just um, found out one of the Amazons there had employees were working under chem uh, chemical stuff and never reported or trained them about it, which it happens in our place too. Sometimes, you know, I will be working and I'll touch something chemical and I'll tell them my hands would kind of feel weird, but there's nothing they can do. So I basically have to use my own medical and go to the where and find out, unless I have proof. So why I'm here is, um, so in the, in the lighting of the recent OSHA um, sanitation against in several states which revealed Amazon exposed workers to hazard chemical at warehouse, priority speeding, overworking, well-being, directly rating related injury. And that's one of the reasons the injuries are so high. Ongoing investigation of alleged underreport injury. It is not shocking to us because we experienced that working there. I work 10 hour shift, four days a week sometimes. Um, some days I do flex, but just working there, I can always speak for myself. 
You know, I can always fight for myself. But majority of the workers there, uh, Latinas and Somalians, they really don't speak the language. Especially with my community, we don't have translators. As I was working there, I always told the managers, you guys don't pay me to translate. You should have a translator here. They have for certain shifts, but not for theirs. So it is really important to us that you guys do pass that bill because that's the most important thing is coming to work and feel safe because at the end of the day, we have family. Like me, I'm a mother of two children who are in college. I want to be able to go home, be safe with my kids and not go home with my back aching or my, you know, worrying about the next day if they're going to come and tell me, hey, your speed is low. I try my best, but they don't care. You know, I see a lot of people who break their back because they got bills and family members to take care of. But Amazon does not care. It's just the system that they have there is not fair to the employees who work there. You know, they pressure us. Um, some people don't speak the language. They fear them. They put the fear in them. So it will be super, super important if you guys pass this bill because we do love working. We do our part. We just want the government and other people to see that it's not fair what Amazon is doing to other employees. And thank you so much. Anyone has a question? Thank you very much, Ms. Jama. And I think what we'll do um, for the purposes here of our presentation, we'll save any members' questions until after the speakers have um, can, come, all of our speakers have gone, and then we will have our discussion uh, amongst the committee. So right. thank, thank you, you if you're so able much. to stay. Appreciate thank you very much. And then next um, we have Mohammed Hassan. Good afternoon, Mr. Hassan. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Senate Labor Committee. And um, um, welcome also um, Sabah Youssef. Um, That's thank you for joining us to interpret um, so that we can all understand fully what everybody is saying. Um, um, if you would, for the record, please introduce yourself and uh, both of you, including um, our uh, translator, and then um, we look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mohammed Farah Hassan. I am on my seventh year working with Amazon. And uh, My name is Sabah Yusuf. I am an interpreter. And I am one of the workers who have language barrier. Um, and I have been injured in the time that I've been there three different occasions. Most injuries happen during the months of November and December. And this is when Amazon calls it prime time, and this is when we are expected to do a lot of work. And Everybody there is, knows exactly what their job is. Uh, what we don't know is what the goal of the company is and what we are expected to do. So, for instance, I'll give you an example. We are told that you have to reach um, a goal of 100, uh, 100 for an hour, for instance, but you don't know where to start from. So it doesn't say from that to this number. You're giving that particular number, and you have to um, achieve that. And that creates uh, worrisome. So you're constantly thinking about this number that you have been told to meet, and in that 10-hour shift, 
you sometimes forget to go to the bathroom, even though you want, you need to go to the bathroom. Sometimes you forget about your break. Sometimes you forgot about your lunch, and you're in this image of just making sure that you reach this goal. Sometimes, even if you are injured, you don't feel the pain until after your shift is done. This causes you go home and you're in a bad mood already and you're in pain and you cannot have time with your family and you're irritated and you're irritable and that sacrifices your family time. Amazon Marka, Watatkas, Wilwil Kakunol, no asa Kushakina, Mehuptid, Waktial Wadena Yahita. So if I give you an image of Amazon, that's the picture I will paint is that you are constantly worried and you will not know when you will be fired. Thomas and Hadalush Kaiso, Yadi Ad Manta Timato, Limit Casa Lagarraba, Edukumashi, so Warren Kalusi. Kelio had Ugankar Tagor to Lugu Erie, Malin Katambet son of Otto, Bachkaga or at Kuso Gelikeru. So you could be there where for ten years, you can be brand new there. It's hard to know what the limits are set for you. Sometimes it's hard to know if you reach them or not. Sometimes you don't even know that you have a warning. The next day you come to work, your badge is not working. That means you've been fired. Um. So the most of the pain comes from the muscles. And this comes from the repetitive that you're doing to your muscles. And those injuries are not easy to recover from. And you're constantly on the go, on the go, like a robot. And you and your manager, that's all you're doing is he's telling you to go, go, meet the goal that I, you're expected to meet. And that's, that's constantly what happens. Every second and six second in Adela Sadacher at four Sato, I'm at two is the same as all at Hosu Fadisot. Every six seconds, you are twisting, turning, bending constantly. Say no one is America Alkisa. Just imagine that in an hour. Already what thou aren't I? You already injured. Marka and in Carl Sanaya. Senator, you think Senator Red, I'm Carl Sanaya, and at Baskaray San Safety Shakala, oh good, see Lopet Badio, Shakala Warehouse Kashaki. My request to you is to please pass this um, bill so that you can protect every worker that works in a warehouse. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Hassan. Um, uh, next, we have Ricky Schreiner. If, if uh, Ms. Schreiner could join us at the testifier table. Welcome to the Senate Labor Committee, Ms. Schreiner. Um, if you could state your name for the record, and um, we look forward to hearing your testimony. Hello, my name is Ricky Schreiner. I'm a 22-year Teamster and UPS veteran. I guess you could say I'm a bit of a professional warehouse worker. Warehouse work has a unique set of safety challenges to address to keep people safe and successful while on the job. UPS has proven that a company can provide not only appropriate safety measures and training, but also a committee for employees to voice safety concerns, and still remain one of the most, if not the most, successful shipping company in the world. I am disheartened when I read about or talk to Amazon employees. They are not afforded the same protections or opportunities that I am. Amazon's policy of churn and burn treats people as, dispos <clears throat> excuse me, as disposable resources to be used, abused, and set aside. 
Amazon has the ability and the means to provide safe environment for people who work hard every day to make them the trillion dollar company that they have become. And they would still remain one of the most profitable companies to ever exist. Working at UPS allows me the security and the protection to pursue the American dream and be a productive member of my community. I truly believe the success of any business or society for that matter, correlates directly to the livelihood, health, and the happiness of its people. It's time for Amazon and other companies like it to treat its employees as they should be treated, with respect, dignity, and as the foundation of their success. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. All right, and I believe that concludes all of the people who we have um, who had signed up to testify on Senate File 58. With that, I would like to go now to any member questions or discussions that we have. Senator Murphy is here to um, in, engage with us on her bill, and also um, I believe we have someone from the Department of Labor and Industry here who can also answer any questions that members may have. Um, yes, Senator. Thank you, Chair. Um, I feel like if a, a business is treating their employees poorly, it needs to be addressed. Um, but I'm hearing Amazon, 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 Amazon. So if this is that, they, they can't be doing this. So you're clear, it, they, people can't treat their employees like crap, right? Um, but I also don't think, you know, if this bill passes as is, if, if there are other companies that aren't doing this, I don't want them to get hurt. So um, I would somehow like to see it focus on this issue because it, this does need to be addressed. Um, so I, I, have, I was writing down questions and if these are true things, these need to be out in the public and people need to know about it. Um, so I, I guess I'll just, I'll ask you a question. You can tell me how this works. I don't know if, you know, when these things happen, do they go to the Department of Labor or OSHA or do they have, does Amazon have a complaint department? So the, there's questions I need to, I don't know what's going on. So I would like, the first question I'd like to ask, you know, people aren't being allowed to eat. Um, thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. Yeah. Should we start with that? Senator Murphy? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. I appreciate that, and I'm gonna work very hard to answer your questions. What we're hearing from the testifiers is that the, the pressure to produce and to meet the quotas, which are sometimes uh, visible and sometimes not, are putting barriers in place for workers to be able to take breaks in order to eat, um, to use the restroom, uh, to rest their body, um, and to pray if they choose to. Um, that is the, the model of quotas and the push of productivity, and that is one of the things that we, we are seeking to resolve in this proposal by making sure that the quotas are clear and that the, the ability for the workers to do the things that they should be able to do at work, the things that we all do at work, take a break, um, take time to go to the bathroom, to eat, to fulfill our bodies, um, that they're able to do that as well. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Wiesberg? Thank you, yeah. So, but so they're, so they're literally not being allowed to eat or go to the bathroom, though. Is that, I, I'm guessing they probably have 15 minute breaks or something. So you're hearing from the workers that they're not allowed to do this. Is that correct? Thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator. Yes, what we're hearing from the workers is the pressure to meet the quotas is interrupting their ability to do the things that under federal law and under state law they should be able to do. Okay. Any um, follow-up, Senator Wiesenberg? Um, and I have another question. So has um, like the Department of Labor been there to investigate this? I know OSHA says that, I mean, here it's, I have the data here that says OSHA says there's more rates of injury at this particular warehouse now. Um, so I, in my mind, if they've been told about these actions, why is Amazon still operating? Thank you, Senator Wiesberg. Senator Murphy, and perhaps this is something that the Department of Labor and Industry, if there's a representative here, might come up and speak to as well, but I'll pass it to you, Senator Murphy. I appreciate that, Madam Chair. I, I do think that it would be useful to have the commissioner join us. Uh, and I also think that we have our expert, uh, Ms. Tong, um, who could also speak to some of the data um, if you have questions about the data. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murphy. And first we can go to Commissioner Blissenbach. Thank you for joining us today, Senator, or Commissioner. And appreciate any um, insight you can share. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair McEwen and members of the committee. Um, I can address the, the, the this bill um, requires things that are not currently required by OSHA standards. So 
if OSHA were called out to the Amazon facility or any warehouse facility and um, we were looking at things like has the quota been communicated to the worker, the, if, even if it hadn't been, it's not something we could currently enforce. Um, transparency in, in these types of requirements, whether it be quotas, or, uh, is not only helpful to the employee, but it's also help, helpful to us as regulators. Because if we go in and, and we're seeing that maybe there's an allegation that break laws are not being complied with, um, the employer's often the employer's response is, well, yes, it is. We give everybody a 15-minute break. Um, but if the response from the worker is, well, I feel pressure from the quota that I am unable to take that break, it's helpful for us as regulators to know what that quota is. Um, so I think that's really the, the transparency is important for the worker. It's important for the, for the regulator. Thank you, Commissioner. And um, Ms. Tome, are you with us still online on Zoom? I am. Yes, I am. Thank you. Do you have any insight into this question as well? And did you hear the question? I did hear the question. Um, I think, you know, as as the previous speaker noted um, from, from the department, OSHA regulations do not address the central issue of transparency that this bill is designed to address. Um, and, you know, OSHA regulations have not really kept pace with the kinds of data-driven management tactics and algorithmic management tactics that Amazon uses. Um, you know, OSHA can cite workers around sort of the, you know, the awkward motions that they have to use to lift certain packages, but that's different than the issue that we're talking about here, which is really a standard about communication between employer and employee about job expectations. Thank you, Ms. Tome. Senator Wiesenberg? Uh, thank you. Um I'm gonna, I, I guess I'll yield to other members if they have questions that maybe I can't think of right now, so yeah. Very good, thank you. Yes, yeah, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so first I wanna address the, all the people that came, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, appreciate your hard work um, and testifying. It's hard uh, to come here and testify, so thank you for coming. Uh, and I agree with uh, my colleague, Senator Wiesenberg, that yeah, this, uh, we want safety. Um, so I did hear Amazon a lot, like, um, was spoken and, uh, but I'm just going to ask, uh, I'm not sure who would know the answer, but the quotas. So the understanding is they're not told what they're supposed to do. Is that what I'm hearing? I and mean, that's kind of what I heard. So they're just, uh, have a camera on them and then they either produce or they don't. And they just let them know after the fact. Is that correct? Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Dornick. Uh, as I have listened to the stories of workers and as they testified today, uh, they have uh, responsibilities uh, to fulfill the obligations of their position and a quota, and sometimes they know what the quota is and sometimes they don't. And when they don't meet it, sometimes they are punished and sometimes fired. Uh, and that is a hard situation to manage in. We can all imagine that. If we don't know what the expectation is, uh, it is hard to then meet that expectation. Uh, and uh, they do use means, and we've heard this testimony as well, of surveillance and electronic surveillance uh, to make sure that they're meeting those quotas, though they don't necessarily know it. And they don't always know how they're compared to their peers. Uh, so they are in a situation where they're expected to meet a number that they don't always know, and they are being tracked. Um, in such a way that makes it a, a challenging work situation, which is one of the reasons why we're talking about more transparency for the workers so they can comply with the obligations of their work and work safely. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yeah, any follow-up, Senator yeah. Jordan? Um, so what do other warehouses do then? Because this is uh, going to affect other warehouses. How do they manage their uh, workforce? Madam Chair, I think yes. this is a good question for our expert. Thank you. Ms. Tom? So Amazon is, is fairly singular right now in, in developing this particular kind of intensive electronic surveillance uh, combined with, with their disciplinary system. I think one of the testifiers mentioned time off task. Um, this is a system in which Amazon tracks by the second uh, you know, if you take a moment to take a drink of water or use the bathroom or, 
you know, attend to an emergency or, or an injury, every second is docked against you. Uh, and, and then you are, you know, you're disciplined when you use too much. And the other piece of this, um, of the transparency is workers don't have access to the data, right? So they don't, you know, so they're, they're you know, not only are the quotas constantly changing um, based on these algorithmic um, techniques that Amazon applies in terms of, you know, what is the median and are you 70% of the, et cetera. I mean, these things are constantly changing, but at the same time, the worker doesn't actually know, you know, how much time off task they have taken. You know, all of that is on a central computer that they have no access to. And that's what this bill also is designed to address. Um, you know, the, the worker as, um, uh, as, as one of the testifiers mentioned, they keep you in a constant state of, of fear that you're going to lose your job, you know, your badge just stops working because, you know, the central computer has tracked that you've used X amount of time off task, you know, in the last week, but you have no access and there may be a mistake there. Um, and, you know, maybe you were using the bathroom in a legitimate, you know, in a legitimate way, but there's no way for the workers to see that data or to correct it or to contest it in any way. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you very much, Senator Dornick. Dornick. Thank you, Ms. Tung. Uh, so one more, one more question, and I'll yield the floor too. So, um, so going to the bill, there's uh, on uh, page four, uh, 4.9. Well, it starts on 4.8. Uh, just that last part. Uh, a cause of action on, under this section must be commenced with when, within one year of the date of injury. So I just want a clarification on that. Um, I mean, I worked, uh, I'm a, a carpenter, worked many years, worked for uh, an employer, and uh, we were had a certain amount of time that we needed to let, the, let them know we were injured on the job uh, for workman's comp reasons and stuff. So just wondering where the one year came up, where, uh, where you came up with that, and what does that exactly mean? Thank you. Senator Murphy. Would, or Commissioner, would you like to take that? Thank you, Chair McEwen um, and Senator Dornick. Um, I take that, that language in the statute to not mean physical injury, but rather injury meaning violation of the statute or of the bill. And I, I, I want to make sure, because what I'm hearing, I think, is Senator Dornick asking about this is a statute of limitations under which there's a certain time period where someone would have to bring that action, and it's a year. You were inquiring about that one year. Why was that chosen? Is that correct? Madam Chair, yes. Um, so I was just trying to get, I wasn't exactly sure what it meant, so I was getting clarification. Injury, but you're saying the... Um, so a year after, you're saying they violated, so if they would violate this uh, new statute, that they could wait up to a year to file the claim. Is that correct? Thank you, Senator Dornick. Um, any, would either of you like to take that question? So Madam Chair, um, could Senator Dornick repeat his question because I was listening to two things at one time. Thank you. Would you please repeat, yes. Senator Dornick? Uh, Senator Murphy. Uh, so I was asking with the um, injury, no, I was saying that uh, since the injury at 48 hours, that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about the statute. So if they violate the statute, then they can uh, have one year, up to one year to uh, that civil suit that they can do up to a year. I think that's what you're saying. Is that correct? Madam Chair and Senator Dornick, yes, that is what we're talking about. And I am sure that that is going to be further uh, explored when we get to the Judiciary Committee, which is this bill's next stop. All right, thank you. This follow-up? Yes, yes, So Senator is, that, is that normal? Do you, do you know if that's a normal uh, amount of time? Okay, I see somebody in the audience shaking yeah. their head. So. <laughs> Senator right. Murphy. Um, I yeah. didn't see the nodding behind <laughs> me, but yes, as I understand it, it is normal. Okay. Yes, and you. as Senator, a, thank you, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Yes, and as a, as a trial attorney, uh, I can tell you that a, a year statute of limitations is actually pretty short. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, are there any other um, discussions? Oh, actually, I have a list here. My apologies, Senator Grunhagen. You're next on the list, and I will put you well, on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I have a question for uh, Senator Murphy. When I look at the bill on page three. It talks about 
that the injury rate has to be 30 percent higher than that year's average. So in other words, you know, we have, over, based on the information I have, we have over 200 warehouses that would fall under this uh, bill. However, if their average was below the 30 percent, uh, was below that 30 percent uh, threshold, they would not be subject to the the uh, uh, aspects of this bill. Is that correct, uh, Senator Murphy? Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and Senator Grunhagen. The, the, I'm sorry to say that the bill in front of me uh, doesn't, it's not complete, so I'm gonna take a look. I just wanna make sure that I'm reading the language before I answer your question. What's well, page three, uh, right around uh, 3.27 yeah. to 3.34. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. And Senator Murphy, could you move the microphone a little closer to where your mouth is so that we can make sure to hear you yes. as so, well as we should? Senator Grunhagen, as you can see in the bill, uh, it's talking about what would trigger an investigation. Okay, so uh, Madam Chair, I have a follow-up question. Yes. Oh, Go okay. ahead. Yeah, so in other words, uh, the way I read this, they, a particular warehouse, and, we're, and we've talked about Amazon here, would have to be 30% higher for that year's average of uh, injury rates for this, this bill to actually apply. Is that correct? Thank you, Senator Gruenhagen. Um, yes, if there's someone, if, and if you could please introduce yourself for the record, and, the, um, and then if you have an answer, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, Chair McEwen. My name is Kyle Macarios, representing the Teamsters. My name is Kyle Macarios, representing the Teamsters Union and the Awood Center. Um, Chair McEwen, Senator Gruenhagen, great question. No, the 30% threshold in the bill um, is you take the 210 warehouses that you referenced uh, that, that are listed, in the, that are noted in the fiscal note, you take an average injury rate. Anyone that's 30% above that average, right? Any individual warehouse that's a significant outlier that injures significantly more workers than their peers would then be subject to uh, an OSHA audit uh, in the following calendar year, I think is the way the bill's intended to work. Thank you, sir. Senator Grunhagen, you have follow-up? Oh, follow thanks, uh, thank you for that explanation. And that my, was my understanding when I read that section, is basically if you're under that 30% you know, a higher average, then this doesn't apply. Thank you, Senator Gruen. Is there a response to that? Sure. Um, Chair McEwen, Senator Gruenhagen, um, I think that the, the other provisions of the bill, including the, the, the requirement that a, a, you know, that workers understand the production quota that, un, that under which they're working would apply to all warehouses, right? That if you have a production quota, you must tell your workers what it is. They must be able to request their work speed data would, would apply to all of the warehouses that meet the other criteria in the bill. But there would not be an OSHA um, investigation triggered except for those that are significant outliers uh, whose injury rate is 30% above the, the average of, of their peers. Thank you. Senator Gruenhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thanks for that. So basically, the rest of the bill would still apply, even if they were under that 30%, uh, uh, they're, they're below that 30% higher threshold. Is that correct? Uh, sure. Chair McEwen, Senator Gruenhagen, yes, that is correct. All warehouses that, are, that have 100 or more employees under those NAICS codes would have to, if they have production quotas, we need to tell their workers what those quotas are. We need to provide the data about their, their, their own work speed, and then you know, they would have to have access to their, to their peer uh, aggregate data as well. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Senator Gruenhagen, any follow-up? Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, and that where I have a little bit of a concern is that I can almost understand, you know, I, nobody wants some of the, you know, what's happening in some tests when you can't go to the bathroom, you can't eat, you know. I worked in a warehouse, okay? But uh, I just think that some of these principles, if you do exceed that 30%, I can understand some of that. You see what I mean? In other words, looking in there. But I just think if you're under that, then you're working, you know, like we had testimony, that these quotas are actually contributing to this high injury rate and not being able to go to the bathroom, not being able to go to eat or whatever. 
okay? The point is, if you're under that, I just think that uh, you shouldn't have to, you're not running your warehouse in a way that is producing injuries. And the whole intent of this bill, as I see it, is to address the fact of a warehouse that is producing a high amount of injuries based on quotas and, uh, and some of the other stuff that has been mentioned. I can almost understand a little bit that, but I can't understand why we would put all these other things on warehouses that don't trip that 30% uh, meter. And that's where I have a real concern. And I would, I would just encourage members uh, to uh, think that through, that why would we add additional things to uh, warehouses that are operating at a rate that is not producing injuries. I mean, they must be doing something right. And, and yet I can see that uh, if they're having an excessive amount, 30% higher or whatever, um, that something needs to be looked into. So I would just ask uh, Senator Murphy to think that through in relationship to this bill to let those warehouses off that are operating in a way that aren't contributing to this high injury rate, which is what the real problem is. And we've heard the name of the company over and over and over again. And we really don't have any testifiers from any other warehouse. And uh, I'd be a lot more comfortable with that bill. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. And I will um, let you respond. And just I have a, a Senator Murphy to that point. I believe you had a... Or Senator, Senator Marty, I apologize, you, Senator Madam Marty, Chair. to that point. Senator Grunhagen, the, the trouble is that they're 30% higher at that one facility, but the other warehouses are almost seven injuries per 100 workers in the year. I mean, it's one out of every 13 workers is injured in the year. It seems to be from the report, it looks like that's about double what other businesses have. To me, that's frighteningly high. Seven out of 100 is a pretty high number. It seems to me at least because the rest of this isn't onerous. It's just saying if you're going to have these um, forcing people tracking somebody like this, you got to spell out what you're doing. It's not an onerous bill. And I'm just saying that you're making it sound like the other warehouses are just fine and dandy. I'm saying that they're much worse than other workplaces. So let's at least get the data. I think the bill is worded well in saying we're going to investigate one that's way above the average, but the average ones are not doing that great compared to other employers. Thank you, Senator Marty. To this specific point we're um, talking about right now, Senator Liskey. Uh, Senator Marty, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I agree with you that uh, it is concerning. Warehouses are a significantly higher injury rate. Um, as we have heard testimony to, um, the part that I think Senator Grunhagen is speaking to is that Amazon is significantly worse than the already existing situation. Um, being a chiropractor, working in healthcare, I work on a lot of repetitive injury patients and can speak to the fact that a lot of my patients, actually quite a large number, come from these facilities um, and other warehouses. And I would argue that uh, working in a warehouse is not safe. Uh, it's not safe no matter how we look at it. This piece of legislation is not going to stop that injury frequency. Um, these people are doing repetitive motion jobs all day. Uh, and the factories are not great, or the warehouses are not great for that. Um, so yes, it's a higher incidence of injury because of the job description. Um, it would be similar to trying to compare this to another dangerous job, um, as we have all seen before. Um, so the concern here is, and, and the, the testimony is quite clear, uh, Amazon is our problem. Uh, what can we do as a state to direct specifically to Amazon? It becomes a dangerous, slippery slope because now you're mandating a specific business versus mandating across the board. Um, but again, like Senator Grunhagen is concerned, that's, that's the concern. Thank you, Senator Liskey. Um, um, just, I want to give the bill's author and our um, experts who are here also a chance to respond to this issue, and then I will return to you, Senator Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I do appreciate the questions and especially the recognition about uh, that there are many workplaces that are, are by design unsafe. Uh, and our effort here together, I hope and believe, is to bring some fundamental transparency 
to try and make the workplace more safe, knowing that it is a repetitive is a repetitive process in this assembly and this productivity. So I do appreciate and hear uh, the the focus uh, on one. Um, I do think that the data that Ms. Tong has brought forward demonstrates right the the the, the rate of injury that is significantly higher in these warehouses. And the work that has been done to bring this bill together uh, is trying to look at that, that rate of injury and the set of worker codes in order to make sure that we're drawing the right line uh, around the right kind of work uh, as we address this proposal. And we will continue to refine that with your help and your support and your questions, and I appreciate them. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Um, uh, yeah, or, or will you pass, Senator Grunhagen? We have other people in line, so if you're done with your comments, we'll no, move I'm forward. Not. But no, I was just going to say, you know, I before I would go that far on all the warehouses, I'd want to see comparative data of injuries from other states in in warehouse situations. I mean, we could pass all the laws we want and make it as intrusive as possible, but there is. You know, uh, I mean, things do happen in, in dangerous jobs. And I, like I said, I worked in a warehouse, and there were injuries there when I, when I was there. In fact, I wound up being the manager of the warehouse. And, uh, but those injuries were accidental. They weren't overly worked. They just made mistakes with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, Bobcat, or, or I mean the forklift, and a few other things. It was just human error, and uh, and that's going to happen in those types of situations. So before I'd support something that would be this intrusive uh, into all warehouses, I would start with this 30 percent. I could almost support that uh, based on the testimony, but um, I would rather have it apply, get some additional information which you seem to talk about too a little bit, before I'd go any further than that. Because, you know, I mean, we do live in a, a world of accidents. I mean, we could pass all the laws we want, we're still gonna have car accidents, okay? Uh, and uh, we wanna be as safe as possible, but yet uh, I, do, I would like some additional data on that. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Grunhagen. And to, I have a couple people that want to make a comment to this point. Senator Pappas, is, is your comment to this point, or can... I, it, Madam Chair, I actually forgot what the point is. My, okay. my comments are to the bill. I'm so, sorry? I can wait. My comments okay. to the okay. entire bill, Okay. so I can wait. Thank you very much, Senator Pappas. And so then to this point, Senator Dornick, did you have something? No? That's okay? Okay, Senator Housechild. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Grunhagen. Thank you for, you know, you're your digging in on this issue. You know, I think if our answer was to every worker, well, that's a dangerous job, good luck, uh, then we'd be going back to the pre-industrial era. Uh, we've had a lot of instances where we have inter implemented worker safety standards to ensure protections for workers in circumstances that are shown in evidence and data to be extra dangerous or perhaps employer conditions that are extraneously difficult on employees. Uh, we know from this bill uh, and from the testimony we heard that Amazon has a unique policy in place that is quo quotaing employees without their knowledge uh, of what those quotas are, and that is causing additional injuries on the job. And so what this legislation does is it ensures that that policy doesn't spread. We, we do not want other warehouses to realize uh, that they're putting workers on what is an essentially an assembly line, uh, uh, you know, automatically keeping them working without, uh, you know, without the opportunity for drinking and, and bathrooms and those types of things. So the bill addresses the issue that we see in this particular employer and make sure that others uh, are not putting those difficult circumstances on their employees. And then it has a standard that if it's above an average uh, uh, workforce injury rate of 30%, that OSHA can go in and find out what the deal is uh, and why those injuries are taking place. So I think it's a pretty standard bill, worker safety bill, and it makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Senator Housechild. To this point, Senator Liskey, briefly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, real briefly, I don't think any of us up here said that uh, we're telling any workers good luck. Um, so I find that slightly offensive in what was just said um, because all of us have actually just addressed the fact that we agree 
it is dangerous. We are concerned about the danger. And so speaking to that point, we agree. We're just trying to find a, a good middle ground so we're not hurting everybody involved. So. Thank you, Senator Liskey. Yes, S Senator Pappas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess my comments are to the point, whatever the point is. Um, I, I think that the expectation is when you take a job that you know what the job description is and you know what the, uh, the roles and the expectations are and what standards you're being held to. So I think, you know, even though we have kind of an egregious offender, I agree with Senator Hochschild that this kind of management style could spread to other warehouses if they're not there already because it's obviously uh, very profitable to work people to death. But to have a situation where people don't know if they've reached their quota and so they're afraid to take their lunch break or their um, I mean, when I've been in the workforce, I was required to take my break. It wasn't like I could not take it. You know, I worked in a union um, grocery store and, you know, you have a half hour for lunch, you have 15 minutes, you go take your break now. There was not like, oh no, I, you know, I haven't reached my quota of selling enough groceries, I don't think. Or maybe I have, so maybe I shouldn't take my break. I mean, it's that sense of uncertainty, I think is really unfair to workers because you're holding them to standards that they can't possibly know how to meet. So thank you all so much for taking time out of um, your very stressful jobs to be here today with us and share your stories. Thank you, Senator Pappas. Senator Dornick. <laughs> Madam Chair, thank you. Um, so I first want to recognize Ms. Schreiner for her testimony. Thank you for uh, talking about UPS and the good policy they have. And that's what we all sitting around this uh, table here want. So thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, we appreciate uh, what they're doing. Um, and so to Senator Murphy, uh, Mike, I'm, I'm for the, uh, let's see, I want to say, it. we see there's a problem and other colleagues have already said it. Uh, we're willing to um, negotiate or I'd like to, you know, because I have not had uh, anyone other than one person came to me, um, a friend of mine, that told me about this bill, because uh, he's a, a union guy, and so am I. And so he told me about it, and I said, I, I, you know, I, I, I like where you're going. There's just some things, and I'm, I would really like to uh, have uh, that across the aisle um, that we talk, we heard about on the floor and how we're going to work together and make bills better. So I'm asking if you would uh, work with me on some issues here. Um, this is my wheelhouse. I'm a, a, a union guy. You're a nurse, and so if there's some issues in the, the nursing area, I, or doctor, or medical, I would, you know, and it was a bill we're working together on, I, I would, you have expertise in that area that I don't have. So, so if you're gonna vote for, if we have to vote today, I can't support it, but we, we support the concept, we see there's a problem, and so we're willing to just, can we slow down a little bit? Because it's been really hard for us to try to, keep up with all this stuff because this is this is not easy stuff this is complicated stuff and uh fast and furious uh doesn't always work i mean we can get you guys can get it done but uh, i think that you want the best um product for the state of minnesota i i know you do so that's my request thank you thank you um senator dornick senator grunhagen oh thank you madam chair yeah i just want to follow up with a comment I'm trying to think of what the point was also. No, <laughs> it's gotten convoluted a little bit. But anyway, the, uh, my point is this. Is, is there anything that prevents a person who, fall, if they work at a warehouse that's under that 30%, from going to OSHA or the Department of Labor and asking for an investigation because they are, they're considered that they're working in an unsafe environment? Thank you, Senator. Is there any pro prohibition on that right now? Thank you, Senator Gurren Hagen. Um, perhaps, Commissioner, you could speak to that. Thank you, Chair McEwen and Senator Grunhagen. Um, the answer is no. Uh, in fact, people can make complaints to OSHA. Uh, but one of the issues, as I somewhat addressed in my testimony earlier, is that the things that 
this bill would require an employer to do are not currently required under OSHA standards. So if OSHA was called out because um, someone doesn't understand the, the quota that they're working under or hasn't been um, provided with that information, OSHA would not be able to do anything in response to that. So it's really about that transparency being provided to the worker so that they understand what their obligations are and understand uh, what they're being expected to do. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, just a follow-up comment. For, yes, Thank go you, ahead, Madam Senator. Chair. Yeah, it just, uh, I guess I reinforce, you know, in this particular thing, uh, uh, area, I just think incrementalism is best. I think you start with the 30%, you know, like I said, I could support that, uh, and then you, you expand if necessary. But I think this sends a message to all employers of warehouses, you better stay under that 30% or these are gonna be the requirements. And I think that's a good, good place to start versus you're all under this mandate regardless of how you've been operating. So those are just my thoughts. Thank you, Senator Greenhagen. And did you have something, Senator Marty? Madam Chair, just real briefly on the bill, I, I think it's an excellent bill. I don't think it's overreaching. And looking at the chart in the study, it says that even the other warehouses are almost double what the construction industry, which is seen as a dangerous job is. Uh, you know, when, when we, somebody said earlier about auto accidents happen too, and they're accidents, and we can't do much about that. We've cut the death toll on highways over 85, 90% over the last century by having safety regulations and safety requirements. That's a millions of lives you're saving. And the, the seven out of 10 workers at other warehouses is being injured in any year is outrageously high. This is such a minor thing. I, I, I can't see saying, well, we're really sympathetic about it, but we can't do anything. If a worker has to live without it, I think it's a reasonable bill, and I urge you to support it. Thank you, Senator Marty. And Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, hearing about the injuries, and obviously we, we want to keep injuries low, but I just want to, we all have to remember what, where we are right now with the age of technology. Are we going to push Amazon too far where they just go totally no people? So I, I'm not saying we need to have injured people, obviously, but we need to keep that in mind, too. If we do this, maybe they'll just say, well, we're going to go automated, and then we're going to lose a whole bunch of jobs. So it's just something to be aware of. Thank you, Senator. Um, and I, I also want um, to second the thanks that we have heard um, to all of the testifiers today and all of the people who have come out in support um, and, 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 and offered their testimony today. It's been um, really informative for all of the committee to hear from you. And we appreciate that you've taken this time out of your lives to come and share your stories with us. Um, members of the committee, there's also um, in our packets, I just wanted to refer people the full study with that data we've been discussing is in your packets. So please go ahead as this bill moves forward, take the time to go ahead and digest that. And then I will go to Senator Dornick before I um, go to Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I just wanted to ask the path of the bill, where else it has to go. And then also I just always like to uh, follow up with thanking all of you again for coming, testifiers. Um, and for the work you do. And also afterwards, I love to meet you. So I will come out. And if you want to talk to me, please do. We want to hear your stories. Face to face is always better. This is, this is good. Uh, but I'll make myself available to you after. Uh, after. Are we going to vote? Or is there, could we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Senator, I, Senator uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Dornick. <laughs> Senator thank you. Murphy, could yeah. we talk uh, and work on some of this? Uh, I will pass it. We'll pass this to Senator Murphy next. Senator Dornick. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, members, uh, for what has been, from my perspective, a very open and open-minded discussion about a proposal and an openness and a willingness to come together around a solution and to do it in a way that achieves our goal. Right. We want to make sure that the people who are working in this industry are safe. And it has been a challenge uh, that has rooted in the history of this country, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, and it is a challenge that I believe that we can rise to and we should. Uh, Senator Dornick, uh, I would love to sit down and talk with you. And uh, I, I think that it would be 
even better if we met together with some of these workers and we worked through uh, the issues that they're experiencing so that as we uh, address the questions that you have and the language in the bill, that we're doing it not just in a you and I fashion, which I think we could do good work together, but with those voices of the workers included. And of course, I would love to do that work with you. Um, we both come from union backgrounds with different expertise, and I believe that we can do that. Yes. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Did you want to say? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Murphy. So that's a yes. That's a yes. Okay. And, you know, I look it's, forward it's to not it. often, Madam Chair, uh, where I feel like it's been really hard to get a word in edgewise with this committee. But <laughs> yes, Senator Dornick, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, Senator Murphy. Murphy. And um, now I believe um, Senator Umu Verbetten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I also just want to express my gratitude to all the workers who are here today to share their stories. Thank you so much for um, your bravery and your testimony, and um, I really want to make sure that you have a safe place to work. Uh, so I move Senate File 58 as amended uh, to go to the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. Thank you very much for that motion. On Senator Umu, Umu Verbetten's motion, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Um, th there. I'm yes, sir. I, yes, Senator. I, I thought we were going to. So you're just going to pass it anyway, and then we're going to work later. Is that what you're saying? I'm mean, sorry, Madam Chair. So, um, so the next stop for this bill is in the um, Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. My understanding is that we heard today from the bill's author, Senator Murphy, that Senator Murphy would be delighted to talk with okay. you as the bill progresses. All right. Yes. Thank you. That's. I was just confused. I thought she was just going to, we were going to work on it first to get it out of this committee. That's what I was understanding. Oh, I see. I see. But that's not the case then. Is that what you're saying? Madam Chair and Senator Murphy. Does that clarify things? You can always talk and work on the bill. Yeah. Okay. Um, there having been more um, ayes than nays, um, the motion prevails and um, Senate File 58 is recommended, as amended, is recommended to pass and is re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. All right, um, we have a lot of business today in the Senate Labor Committee. Next on our agenda is Senate File 2. And we have um, Senator Elise Mann, who is the lead author of Senate File 2, the Paid Family and Medical Leave Establishment and Appropriation, here to um, talk about her bill and present it to us. And we also have a number of testifiers. Um, so um, with that, um, Senator Mann, we would like well uh, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I do have an amendment. Thank you, I, Madam Chair. Thank you. And members, I do have an amendment. Very good. Uh, we have an author's amendment, and I believe, is it Senate File 8, or amendment, uh, the A8. A8 amendment? And the A8 amendment should be in everybody's packet. Um, would you like to speak to the um, A8 amendment, um, Senator? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, the A8 amendment uh, was language requested by the Department of Labor to uh, increase worker protections and it adds a penalty authority in the event that there is retaliation when an employee requests the, uh, this benefit. Very good. Thank you, um, Senator. Um, do I have a motion for... Oh, one moment. Madam Chair, members, I just want to um, quickly... I drafted the amendment to the... A2 underline the amendment from yesterday. So I just want to give some different um, line numbers for to the A8 because now we have a first engrossment after session ended today. So on line uh, 1.2, delete 4 and insert 17. Page 1, line 4, delete 6 and insert 19. Page 1, line 10, delete 8 and insert 21. Madam Chair, I'll move the amendment to the bill has been moved away. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And um, I believe um, Senator Marty. Um, if the bill was not moved, I'll move the bill. If the bill was moved, I'll move the A8 amendment. Um, do we need to move the bill first? Wait, do we just move, move the amendment? Yeah. yeah, I believe we just need to move the amendment. Um, so Senator Marty. Thank you, Senator Marty. Senator Marty moves the A8 author's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the A8 author's amendment passes and is adopted. Um, with that, um, Senator Mann, um, please um, proceed with your presentation of your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so Senate File 2 establishes the Minnesota Paid Family and Medical Leave Program. It would provide Minnesotans with a 12-week leave at partial wage replacement to take care of a new baby, bond with a new child, or take care of themselves or a family member who has suffered from a major medical event. Out of almost 200 countries, the United States is one of seven that does not have such a program in place. And the largely remaining seven countries are uh, mostly micro islands. Uh, the US is certainly the only industrialized nation without such a policy in place. In response to this, 11 states and the District of Columbia have already implemented programs like this, and so we have the privilege of learning from them as well as from the rest of the world on what works and what doesn't. We know that when it comes to staying home with a new child, for example, the um, benefits are innumerable. We have decreased maternal morbidity and mortality, especially at a time when in the US, those rates are at an unacceptable all-time high. There are increased rates and duration of breastfeeding, which we know results in healthier babies and healthier moms. Increased parental mental well-being, with depression being one of the costlier medical diagnoses we face as a society. We have seen better health outcomes for children, decreased rates of ear infections, pneumonia, GI infections, hospitalizations, and clinic visits. And we have seen the increased financial stability of our families after a life-changing event which leads to more people actually returning to the workforce instead of leaving it all together. And it leads to a decrease in reliance on government services. Data showing that 21% of people who have to take unpaid leave will apply for some form of government assistance. Paid family and medical leave is a gender justice issue. We know that when leave is offered equally to everyone in the workplace, the discrimination against women decreases. It is a workforce shorted issue. We know that when this kind of um, program goes into place, we see decreased employee turnover, increased employee retention, and increased productivity in many places. This affects childcare and long-term care, of course. And it is also a racial justice issue. Too often our BIPOC communities are left out of such benefit programs. Our bill is written in such a way that no one gets left behind. We know that the economic stability or inequality and generational transmission of low socioeconomic status in the United States are perpetuated through disparities in early childhood circumstances. PFML can help curb that growth and inequality and boost long-term economic growth for the entire state. And so obviously, PFML is also an economic issue. Um, with that, oh, and you don't have to uh, believe me, I have a box of all the studies that we have gone through to back up all of those claims. Feel free, I will give anyone any copies, whatever you need. Um, and with that, uh, Madam Chair, I would like to introduce Ms. Deborah Fitzpatrick, who will give an overview of how the proposed program will work. Thank you, Senator Mann, um, and welcome to the Senate Labor Committee, um, uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Thank you, Chair McEwen, members of the committee. Skipped forward fast, too fast there. Um, my name is Deborah Fitzpatrick, uh, and I am the Director of Policy and Research at Children's Defense Fund Minnesota. In my prior role at the University of Minnesota, I led a nationally recognized research team that conducted Minnesota's legislatively mandated design and implementation study under contract with DEED. I'll spend just a few minutes grounding the committee in the program structure at a high level and be available later for specific questions as helpful. 
So as um, Senator Mann mentioned, um, the Senate File 2 is structured as a contributory publicly administered insurance program that is self-funded and sustainable over the long term through contributions from workers and employers. It allows self-employed people and, um, co and contractors and business owners to join the program and employers to provide a comparable program. Eligibility is based on workforce participation and healthcare providers certify the need for most types of leave. Much of the program is designed to build on Minnesota's successful UI processes. So among the design options that were considered in the study, uh, the legislatively mandated study, this one was chosen for a variety of reasons. So I'll just lift up three. The first is that it allows us to have a portable wage replacement benefit uh, that is especially important for workers with multiple employers or for those who are changing jobs. Second, it creates the broadest possible risk pool, a feature necessary for keeping costs low and leveling the playing field among employers. And finally, it is the proven, effective, sustainable model that gives all workers an opportunity to earn and count on the benefit from year to year. And it makes those costs currently borne by both employers and workers more predictable. So, and as Senator Mann mentioned, while the bill provides up to 12 weeks for medical and up to 12 weeks for family leave for a serious event lasting more than seven days, uh, what we see from other states is that workers take what they need and that is on average far less than the maximum allowed. For example, Massachusetts allows up to 26 weeks and median leave lengths are 12. In Washington, the entitlement is 12 to 18 weeks and the average is around seven. There is no evidence that Minnesota workers are less committed to their uh, employers or coworkers or more inclined to abuse their benefits than those in other states. In fact, one could argue the opposite. Now, Senate File 2 includes two related uh, uh, provisions or components. Uh, the one we're going to be focusing on today is the employment protection piece, uh, primarily. Uh, but I wanted to lay out how these two pieces are connected. So the first part is wage replacement that we've already talked about. Workers become eligible for those after meeting an earnings threshold and having that certified qualifying event. And then the employment protections in the bill, again, those are the things like right to return to your job or continuation of health benefits. A worker has to be eligible for the wage replacement, as we just discussed, plus has to be with that um, employer that they're taking a leave from for 90 days. I wanted to lift up a couple of other uh, components quickly that um, are relate to the jurisdiction of this committee as well. The leave entitlement in Senate File 2 runs concurrently with those provided under Minnesota's unpaid pregnancy and parenting leave law, 181.941, and also the Federal Medical and Family Leave Act. So in other words, that's in Section 34. It means that uh, you would not be stacking those leave entitlements. Uh, retaliation, employee right to reinstatement, and continued insurance benefits provisions are designed in this bill to be parallel to FMLA, again, to ease that, um, the, the administration. And finally, enforcement uh, for this part of the bill uh, comes with, from the Department of Labor and Industry, which is why it's here. Uh, but it, and, and I wanted to just call out that that um, enforcement piece includes conciliation services, a conciliation services option to resolve disputes without having to go through the court system. So with that, I will be available for questions later. Thank you, Ms. Pet Fitzpatrick. Next, we'll go to Ms. Carlin Fontaine to give us a description of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I think Ms. Pat Ms. Fitzpatrick went through a lot of the pieces that are under the jurisdiction of this committee, but I wanted to walk through specifically where in the bill those, those sections are that are under the purview of this committee. So if, you, um, if you're looking at the first engrossment, the first section is on page two, starting at line one. This is section two, and this relates to compliance orders. And it would give uh, enforcement powers over the specified sections of chapter 
268B, and 268B is the new chapter that will uh, be, sets up the program and the, all of the specifications for the new program. So it uh, cites certain sections of chapter 268B that uh, the Commissioner of Labor and Industry would have enforcement powers over. The next section is section three on page two, starting at line 22. This is, would require some information regarding the amounts that are charged back to employers and deducted from their paychecks for the premiums and the amount paid by employers as premiums. This would require this to, information to be included on each paycheck that the employee receives. Then the next section is section 14. This is on page 32 of the bill at line 16. This, this is the employment protections that Ms. Fitzpatrick just talked about and for which the Department of Labor and Industry would have enforcement authority. And the protections include subdiv subdivisions one through six of this section, prohibiting retaliation, prohibiting interference. It, does, uh, it provides that waiver of rights are void, you cannot assign benefits, and then the provision regarding continuation of insurance by the employer and also the employee, employee right to reinstatement. The next section under the purview of this committee is section 19 regarding premiums, specifically in subdivision three, the employee chargeback provision. So, uh, this provides that the uh, premium amount cannot bring the employee's wage below minimum wage. And so this is something that the Department of Labor and Industry would, would look at. This is on page 44, I'm sorry, page 44, line 26, subdivision three. The next two sections are on administrative costs and public outreach, sections 24 and 25, starting on page 50, line 19. Uh, the Commissioner of, of Department of Department of Employment Economic Development will, is allowed to uh, use up, up, to, up to a certain percentage of projected benefit payments for administration, but then it also allows DEED, Employment and Economic Development, to enter into interagency agreement, agreements with the Department of Labor and Industry. And the first one in Section 24, this would be for enforcement costs for the Department of Labor and Industry, and then Section 25 would be for outreach. Um, it's the same kind of scenario where Deed will is allowed to um, use up a percentage of the projected benefit payments, and then uh, an interagency agreement allows uh, Department of Labor and Industry to do some outreach. And finally, the last section that we flagged for this committee is Section 31. As Ms. Pa Fitzpatrick mentioned, this is on page 59, line 29. This is to allow for conciliation services, to allow the Department of Labor and Industry to, to offer those services to help settle disputes under the new program. And that would be it for, for dis discussion, uh, other, you know, unless there are other things you wanna talk about, but as far as this committee, that's what I flagged for discussion. Thank you, Ms. Fontaine. Um, before testimony on Senate File 2, uh, members and testifiers, due to the number of people signed up uh, to testify, we'll be limiting public testimony to two minutes. Everyone should have received this in advance and is invited to share further thoughts to the committee members in written form. With that, we'll go to Commissioner Nicole Blissenbach, Department of Labor and Industry. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, while she's coming up, I just had a quick question about Section 33, the notice requirements. Is the commissioner referred to there, the commissioner of deed or the commissioner of Dolly? That no, uh, prepared by the commissioner. Is that, um, is that let me get to the uh, provision. Okay. If it's, um, Senator, Mr. Chair, Senator Pappas, if it is within Chapter 268B, the commissioner is defined as the commissioner of um, so it would be the Commissioner of Employment and Economic Development because it's in Chapter 268B okay. and that's the defined term. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pappas. Any other questions for counsel on this bill before we get to testimony? Okay, with that, Commissioner Blissenbach. Thank you, Senator Housechild and members of the committee. My name is Nicole Blissenbach and I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate File 2. Most employees will need family and medical leave at some point during their career. 
but approximately 26% of all family and medical leaves do not include any wage replacement. All too often, this leads to workers having to choose between their financial stability and the ability to take leave to care for their own health, the health of a family member, or for bonding or parental leave. Access to paid family medical leave is highly inequitable. While many Minnesotan workers received at least some pay while they were out of work for family or medical reasons, data shows that low-wage workers, African-American workers, Hispanic workers, younger workers, and part-time workers are much more likely to manage leaves without any pay. This proposal is research-supported approach to address these inequities. Similar programs in other states have shown improvements in economic stability for families and positive impacts for children. Societal benefits include removing barriers for women to remain in the labor force, reductions in the need and associated costs for nursing home and other institutional care, reductions in the need for public assistance when a new baby arrives, and less infant care shortages. Without a comprehensive state paid family medical leave program, Minnesotans are missing out on the economic stability and economy boosting effects of keeping people employed while welcoming a new family member, caring for a sick loved one, or recovering from an illness or injury. I want to specifically address the aspects of this bill that are under DLI's jurisdiction and therefore fall under the purview of this committee. Any time a program that offers a benefit to an employee exists, it is necessary to provide protections to employees as they access and use those benefits. The common way to say that is a right without a remedy is not a right. The protections in this bill include a prohibition on retaliation and interference, continued access to insurance, and the right to reinstatement after a leave. These protections fall under the jurisdiction of labor and industry and help ensure that employees will be able to fully realize the benefits of this important program. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and to voice the strong support of the administration for this important legislation. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll save um, questions until after all the testimony. So next up, we have Mr. John Reynolds, State Director, National Federation of Independent Businesses. And after that, Dr. Hannah Lich Lichson, Minnesota Chapter of American Academy of Pediatrics. And if you could please um, state your name and title for the record. Uh, thank you, Chair Hochschild and members. I'm John Reynolds, State Director for NFIB in Minnesota. We represent 10,000 small businesses in every corner of the state. I want to thank Senator Mann for taking time to meet and review our members' concerns last week. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss ways other states mitigate the impact on small businesses. NFIB opposes how Senate, Senate file two. This PFML proposal is an outlier in many ways among the states that have this type of program, particularly in its treatment of small businesses. We have many concerns with the bill, but I'll just discuss the three biggest. First, the cost is an added burden at a time when Main Street is still struggling to recover from the pandemic and keep up with inflation. The 0.7% payroll tax amounts to about a billion dollars to start, and we believe the cost will rise quickly, perhaps even double in the first few years like Washington's. Assumptions used to estimate the program fiscal program costs and payroll tax differ greatly from other states. The 2022 PFML fiscal note assumed average leave length of 6.6 .6 weeks. Washington's average leave length was 10 weeks per customer out of 12 available, and Watt, Massachusetts was 12 weeks in 2022. The cost could skyrocket if the assumptions are wrong. Uh, second, the combined benefit duration of 24 weeks exacerbates one of the biggest challenges facing small employers right now, the workforce shortage. It will be impractical to hire a long-term replacement for a worker on a long-term leave and in many cases, small employers will experience additional uncompensated losses because they won't be able to fill the vacancy. Uh, third, there is a significant administrative burden for small employers, uh, most of whom don't have layers of management or HR departments to aid in compliance. Uh, Deed wrote in last year's fiscal note, quote, the application process, data to be managed and stored, adjudication process, appeal process, premium structure, and financial structure contemplated are all relatively complicated compared to UI. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to testify. I apologize for reading my testimony but I wanted to make sure I got it in. I hate doing that. And I look forward to working with you all on ways to improve the bill for small businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Dr. Lichson, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. Please state your name and, <laughs> and uh, title for the record. 
Hi, and good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and Dr. Mann. Uh, my name is Dr. Hannah Lixon. Uh, I'm a primary care doctor in Minneapolis, and on behalf of nearly 1,000 pediatricians uh, in Minnesota, I'm here today representing the Minnesota chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, I'm here to discuss the importance of paid family and medical leave for the health and well-being of Minnesota children and families. We have a crisis of infant mortality right now in Minnesota. Babies born into black and indigenous families are more than two times as likely to die in their first year of life when compared to white infants. We know that giving parents access to paid family and medical leave reduces infant mortality and improves the health of new parents. But because of the same systemic racism that puts black and indigenous children at higher risk of illness, families in these communities are less likely to have access to paid family and medical leave through their employers. Parental leave is associated with increased rates of breastfeeding, well child checks, vaccinations, and timely visits to the doctor when infants become sick. In addition, the first 12 weeks of life are foundational for children's lifelong behavioral development, including forming loving bonds with their parents. Paid medical leave is also crucial. No three-year-old child should be forced to spend a week in the hospital recovering from surgery or going through chemotherapy without their parent at their side. Sadly, this is a common occurrence in our state because parents are forced to choose between caring for a sick child and going to work to pay the rent. As pediatricians, our calling is to protect and advance the health of all children. And so I'm asking you to come together uh, to pass paid family medical leave and ensure that every child has a chance to live, be healthy, and thrive. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the hearing. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lix Lix Lixon. I think I got that. Um, next up, we have Ms. Lauren Schothorse with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And after that, on Zoom, we have Andrea Rubish, a registered nurse at St. Luke's Hospital. Please state your name and title for the record. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lauren Schothorst, and I'm the Director of Workplace Management Policy for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and also speaking today on behalf of the United for Jobs Coalition, a packet has been submitted for the record on written testimony for, on behalf of that coalition. We appreciate the opportunity to share our opposition, again, to imposing another paid leave mandate on Minnesota's business community. To build on the perspective I shared on Tuesday, Minnesota is already considered a high tax and cost of doing business state. We rank now 45th, nearly last, in business tax climate. So we have less ability to raise taxes than many other states, and as directly compared to the few states that have already enacted a paid leave program. Minnesota's GDP and job growth have been below the national average for the past five years, and the state's November budget forecast predicts flat job growth in 2023 and 2024. Despite this, over 80% of our members offer paid leave in some form already, in addition to a vast suite of benefits addressing a variety of employee needs and employee wants. Ill-advisedly, Senate File 2 places a new payroll tax on every employer in the state to create a broad new state-run insurance program that will collectively cost the Minnesota business community nearly $1 billion annually while creating a mechanism for an employee to be away from his or her job for up to 24 weeks each year. Not yet exactly to say how we will reconcile that stuckability concern with federal FMLA and the proposed paid sick and safe time mandates before the committee as well. This is a big complex proposal and we have significant concerns with the way it is drafted and structured in terms of workability. We are also concerned that an outside actuarial analysis has not been conducted. Based on preliminary fiscal review, without modifications to its initial scope and design, we expect the program to run into solvency issues. In fact, between the time of introduction and as amended yesterday in Jobs Committee, the payroll tax rate has already increased from 0.6% to 0.7%, and there is no lap or cap on this payroll tax. Businesses can't adequately prepare for this type of uncertainty and tax liability, as we recently saw with the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund solvency crisis. In its current form, Senate File 2 would impede Minnesota's competitiveness and economic growth. We hope that legislators will continue to work on the proposal in order to address issues relating to its cost, its size, its scope, and the workability of its construction. We appreciate the opportunity to share our opposition with the committee today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Schothorst. Next, we have 
Andrea Rubish, and after that, on Zoom, we have Justine Henry with the Laurentian Chamber. Please state your name and title for the record. Hello, my name is Andrea Rubish, and I am an oncology hospice nurse at St. Luke's Hospital in Duluth, Minnesota. I'm here today to stress M how- Ms. Rubish? Yep. Um, it's a little difficult to hear you. I'm not sure if there's a way for you to, um, and I know you have your child there with you as well, but any chance you could be closer to the mic? Yeah. Is that any better? It is uh, slightly better, yes. Okay, hello, my name is Andrea Rubish and I am an oncology hospice nurse at St. Luke's Hospital in Duluth, Minnesota. I'm here today to stress how important and life-changing paid family medical leave could be for myself and the nurses I work with. My son is now six months old and from the moment we found out I was pregnant, I was asked by friends and family, how long is your leave going to be? The response was always, it will depend on my employer. It's awful to constantly worry, will I be granted the time off that I need? Will my position still be available when I come back? What will I do if I am denied leave? I had to hope that my time off would be approved and then pray that I would be able to deliver my baby naturally since a C-section would require more time off and more time off means more time I would have to pay myself for or go without pay. Hope and prayer should not be at the center of our decisions on how much time we can spend bonding with our new children or helping our sick family members. I've been with St. Luke's for close to eight years and rarely ever call in sick, but I still didn't have enough sick time accrued to pay myself for my entire leave, despite planning far in advance. If I were to get pregnant again, I don't know what I would do because it would take another eight years to save up time for another leave, only to have to still take some of it unpaid. Is that how family planning should be decided? Now I have no sick time left. What do I do when my baby gets sick or myself or a family member? The current process for how leave is structured results in this reality that I just have to deal with now. And I am one of the lucky ones. I'm healthy, my son is healthy, I got time off. I'm privileged to work in a union with accrued benefits, which allowed me to be paid for a good portion of my leave. But it all comes down to one word, if. If I had had a bad outcome from my birth, if my son had come early or been born sick, if I didn't have accrued benefits, if I had been denied my leave, everything would look so different. What about new nurses, the ones we are trying so hard to recruit and retain, who have not been on the job for eight years? We are supposed to be an industry and a state that cares for our people, that has to include our workers. And riding that line of okay or disaster is not how we should structure our ability to take care of ourselves or our loved ones. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Rubish. Next, we have um, Ms. Justine Henry. And after that, we have Ms. Christina Eichhorn, um, and that will also be on Zoom. Um, Ms. Henry, if you could state your name and title for the record and start your testimony. Yes, thank you for your time today. My name is Justine Henry. I'm the Human Resources and Safety Manager for NTS. We're located on Northern Minnesota's Iron Range. We're a small environmental engineering and consulting company employing about 45 professional and technical people competing in an area with mostly large engineering and consulting companies. As an HR professional in a small business, I know that compensation and benefits programs must be tailored to specific businesses and structured properly serve as a competitive advantage to that business. NTS is proud to offer competitive pay and comprehensive benefits to our employees, including generous paid time off for any reason and flexible working schedules that accommodate intermittent absences and variable working hours. We know firsthand that it's inaccurate to say that small businesses in the state of Minnesota need benefits regulated by the government to be able to compete because we use our benefits to our advantage to compete for talent with our larger competitors. Broad benefits legislation further erodes our ability to do that. We're opposed to SF2 as it's currently written for a few reasons. In an effort to accommodate everyone, every business in every situation, the bill applies an overarching program to all businesses in Minnesota without regard for differences in industries, markets, etc. Multiple testimonies over the past few days have expressed this same concern. SF2 applies definitions and rules that are very broad. For instance, the definition of family member goes well beyond any previous standards and even the definition in the FMLA to cover relationships that are pretty far removed from the applicant. Finally, despite stating the bill doesn't create a claim against employers, SF2 implements another tax on businesses that will increase over time based on program use, but doesn't allow a business to control this through, for example, requiring an applicant to use their PTO instead of the, the PFML. 
I'm asking you today to take some extra time to review this bill with large and small businesses, industries, and across the political spectrum to come up with a leave plan that allows Minnesota businesses to continue to make the choices that work for them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henry. And for the record, and I, I apologize, I didn't do this, I think, with the last speaker, although she may have said it. Could you state where you're, where you're located uh, on Zoom? Um, in Virginia, Minnesota, on the Iron Range. Thank you. And next we have Ms. Christina Eichhorn on Zoom. Yes, hi, um, hello chair um, and members of the committee. I am Christina Eichhorn. I'm currently in downtown Minneapolis as I'm a constituent of Senate District 61. I'm a senior chief steward of AFSCME Local 34 and a member of AFSCME Council 5 and I'm speaking in favor of Senate File 2. In my role as senior chief steward, I help and represent the 2,300 employees of Hennepin County Social Services. Our members are left running on empty when they need to take medical leave for themselves or their families. They must choose between paying the bills and their health, which unfortunately leads to burnout with the sheer amount of the work that is overwhelming our staff. I have personally been present at meetings between my employer and workers where our members face discipline for not working through their caseloads fast enough. In several cases, our members were working through pain or illness when they probably should have been taking an extended period off. Others have had a loved one at home that needed their help, but they couldn't provide it. Our work, while it's incredibly important, is unrelenting, and they couldn't just work through that stress and manage their caseloads as if nothing was wrong. Most employers can't or won't allocate money or staffing to ensure we are able to take these leaves for our physical, mental, and emotional, um, as well as our financial health. Not having paid family and medical leave is causing devastating ripple effects as caseloads increase and continue to overwhelm the workers of Minnesota. Please pass Senate File 2 so this amazing benefit and vital job protection is available to every worker in our state. Thank you, Ms. Eichhorn. Next, we have Mr. Andrew Coplin on Zoom. Please state uh, your name, title, and location, please, for the record. Yeah, hi, my name is Andrew Coplin. I am co-owner of Coplin's Coffee in St. Paul, and I'm in St. Paul right now, and I'm a leader in Main Street Alliance as well. So uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to share my testimony today and also for making it accessible. Um, in 2006, at the age of 24, I started my own business. Though it's tiny, in the last 15 years, we have stood by the side of a hospital bed as one of our employees recovered from the removal of a tumor, and we worked their shifts so their job would be waiting for them after recovery. We have gotten the early morning phone call from a worker who was in a horrendous bike accident that meant months of recovery and could have been deadly. And in March of 2020, when we had to close the cafe, we met with each employee individually to talk about what they needed. We filled out forms together, and we crowdsourced additional money where needed. And when it came time to split up the money we had gathered, I watched these people selflessly say they didn't need their share and gave it to a coworker who needed it more. Paid family medical leave is about changing this. It's about supporting small businesses who on limited resources have too often been asked to make up for where society falls short. It's about minimizing the hardship and unexpected costs on small businesses when they might lose an employee and have to make a choice between paying the staff on leave and hiring someone to temporarily cover their work. To call this a mandate is to assume we're not already caring for each other. We are. To call this costly is to assume we're not already paying. We are. We are not asking you to help us. We are asking you to join us in this work of caring for each other. I urge all of you to advance Senate File 2, and together we can build a community that centers care for ourselves and others and allows us all to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coplin. Next, we have Ms. Laura Ziegler. with the Associated General Contractors of Minnesota. And after that, we have Adam Dunnick, Director of Government Affairs with the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters, if he wants to be ready. Please state your name and title for the record. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Senator Mann, and members of the committee. I'm Laura Ziegler with Associated General Contractors of Minnesota, a statewide construction trade association representing commercial building and infrastructure contractors of all sizes. Today, my comments on Senate File 2 are focused on the approximately 85% of our membership that are signatory to one or more construction trade unions. Working in the commercial construction industry is typically project-based, transitory, and seasonal. 
Construction trade workers such as carpenters, laborers, operating engineers, cement masons, iron workers, and more move from project to project and therefore employer to employer. These transitions can be week to week, month to month. Construction contractors in partnership with the trades have developed a benefit model through collective bargaining agreements that work for their craft workers, and there's variation of benefit funds depending on the trade. But even with the variation, the similarity among all of them is the portability of employee benefits. Stated another way, the benefits follow the individual and are administered through the CBA and the union that the individual is a member of. Their benefits are not tied to a single employer, but rather there is a current system to administer these benefits that accommodate the unique multi-employer environment construction presents. We know it is early in the legislative process and we are working with our partners in the trades on this and we'll be communicating further with the author, but felt it was important to bring forward to this committee today considering your purview. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Siegler. Mr. Adam Dunnick, please state your name and title for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Adam Dunnick with the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. Great to be here today and testify. I'll pick up where I left off with the Jobs Committee. I talked a lot about how we have interacted with this issue as a trade in the, a lot of the ways that Ms. Ziegler just spoke to. Uh, piecemeal by piecemeal, um, different trades have different approaches to pay time off. But I'll just say one thing. This, thing, this issue changed for us greatly during the pandemic. It changed greatly because our members were asked to go to work whether they felt well or not, and if they were sick, then they couldn't work. And as, as most of you probably know, members of the construction industry are only paid if they work. We don't really have a paid time off model, and that's been a, a challenge for us to, to work around. Um, we've talked about handling at the bargaining table, and it's, it's something that we want to continue to push, and we strongly support Senate file too. The other thing that continues to come up is the challenges around mental health in construction. For those of you that follow these types of issues, we've heard about this a lot in the last couple of years, that suicides and depression and challenges around mental health have hit construction industry members very hard. I don't think, and we don't think as an organization, those two items are not unrelated. And so I want to, you to consider that as you uh, discuss this policy going forward. And then lastly, I just want to say a word about the construction industry model. The challenge that we face at times is that our members work in a competitive bid environment. And so the jobs that they get are won because uh, they can compete economically. There are certain contractors that play by the rules. They pay their payroll taxes, they have workers' compensation, they pay unemployment insurance, now they're going to be asked to pay uh, for this uh, coverage as well, which is important and much needed. But there's a different part of the construction industry that does not pay those, those other uh, portions of their bill. They do not have workers' compensation. They misclassify their workers as 1099. They pay them cash. There needs to be strong enforcement language. I, I've talked to the, the author about this issue, uh, and I've talked, I want to speak with both the Commissioner of Deed and Commissioner of Labor and Industry about this issue as well. It's just something that we've seen in other states where there have been FMLA uh, policy in place. It's done a great job to level the playing field for businesses that play by the rules, but there are many that do not, and, and we just want to make sure there's fair consequences for that. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to be here, and, and um, glad to continue the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Donick. Any questions or discussion? Mr. Chair. Senator Marty. Thank you. I thought the testimony was very helpful. I, um, two comments. One of the person from the chamber was saying how we put so many burdens. We are such a difficult state for business. I keep thinking one of the most valuable things we can do for business, make sure they have good quality workers. And I think that's one of the reasons Minnesota's economy has done well because we take better care of workers, and I think that's very valuable. And also just to comment that uh, Mr. Coplin, who spoke, I think he was a business owner in St. Paul, just uh, was going to say that's kind of employers that I think we want to make sure everybody works like. And, um, and I think he was pointing out the fact that not every employer treats their employees like that, and, and that's why this bill is so essential. So I... I recognize people saying this is another requirement, but it's a human requirement to take care of the workers who are the most valuable asset of most businesses. Thank you, Senator Marty. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I've got some amendments. Uh, whenever that's appropriate, or are we just under discussion right now? Um, yes, you may offer an amendment if you have them. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I would like to offer the A9 amendment. And I don't know if everybody has a copy of it. I don't believe so. We will pass those out. Um, in the meantime, Mr. Chair, I'd like to call forward uh, Mr. Reynolds from NFIB and just to comment on my amendment and also uh, the chamber uh, testifier, if they'd come forward. Um, Senator Grunhagen, thank you for that. Can you please describe um, yep. your amendment for us before we have uh, further testimony? Sure, that's what I intended to do. Um, yeah, basically what this, I've got two amendments, A9 and A10, and basically it represents uh, a bill that was passed by the Senate last year. We all agree that we need some type of paid family leave, okay? There's no discussion on that. The question is, how do we go about it? What these amendments do, it allows a private sector solution and it creates a carrot rather than a, the stick of government. And uh, the First Amendment would uh, give families uh, an opportunity to choose short and long-term disability policies. There'd be insurance policies available for employers. And the Second Amendment provides uh, tax credits and other incentives for employers to offer this. So um, it's a way to uh, provide for that family leave, leave in a way that incentivizes the private market. A couple things it doesn't do. It doesn't increase costs but, uh, or a tax of $1 billion. It also can be Im uh, implemented immediately. I understand this, uh, the taxes uh, of 7 tenths is immediate, but the actual plan doesn't get operational till 2025 or late 25 or 26. So um, the, um, the idea here is to, and it's even in the bill, and I do compliment Senator Mann for that, is the opt-out provision. And uh, it allows companies to provide the paid family leave as far as the private sector is concerned. Again, it was passed, I believe, on a bipartisan basis last session here at the Senate. It did not uh, go through the House, but I think it is a, a much better solution than what's currently uh, proposed. Uh, now at this time, I'd like my uh, testifiers I call forward, if they're familiar with the two options we have before before them, why they would, uh, if they could express if they would support uh, the bill that was passed last session by the Senate on a bipartisan basis is the information I have, uh, which is more of a private sector solution rather than a government one size fits all solution. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Um, Mr. Reynolds, we'll go to you first since he called you up first. Um, state your name and title and your comments. Thank you, Chair Housechild and uh, uh, Senator, Senator Grunhagen. Um, John Reynolds with NFIB. Uh, we appreciate this amendment. Uh, we support this approach. We supported it last year when it gained bipartisan support off the Senate floor. Um, this is a very similar approach to what Virginia did, I believe, at the beginning of last year. I believe. Uh, the voluntary and tax credit based approach passed uh, the Virginia uh, the Virginia legislature unanimously um, and this gets at the flexibility that small businesses need um, some small businesses utilize products already like uh, short-term disability insurance to cover the medical medical portion of the PFML proposal. Not all small businesses do that or are able to do that. Um, but, but this does get at the flexibility, the cost control, and the workplace management elements that we're looking for um, in any sort of uh, legislatively created paid leave program. Yeah, Senator Grunhagen. Chair, if if uh, the representative for the Minnesota Chamber would also comment. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Ms. Schothorst, if you'll state your name and title and testimony. Lauren Schothorst, the Director of Workplace Management Policy for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I would agree with the comments issued by my colleague, John Reynolds. 
Thank you, Ms. Schotthorst. Um, and I'm going to, Senator Grunhagen. Yeah, and I guess the point I want to make is uh, these two organizations, which testified against uh, the SF2, do I got, yeah, I got that right. Um, a lot of people might construe, well, they're against paid family leave. They're not against paid family leave, and none of us are here, but it's how we go about it. And I think a private sector solution is much more flexible, less costly, uh, and allows companies to take advantage of certain incentives to implement this for their employees. Because I, I agree with the testimony that's given here, especially the lady with the new baby. Um, you know, I mean, she seemed very apprehensive about having a second child. And uh, I don't want that. But I do think this particular solution if we look at uh, Minsure, if we look at other government programs, uh, MinLARS, uh, the cost explosion when government gets involved, and we can discuss the reasons later, uh, we see happening all over. I know when uh, Minsure passed, the administrative fee was supposed to be 1%, and I think it could be capped at 3 or 3.5%. Well, was that 1% for less than a year, and then they jumped it right up to 3%. So I think the, the chance of this program creating exploding cost in the future versus a private sector solution is, uh, is uh, that there's a risk there that I don't think at this particular time we want to put onto our small businesses and, and businesses in general. So with that, uh, I would uh, offer the A9 amendment. It is a delete all at this uh, point. If it doesn't pass, as I doesn't pass, uh, I would have uh, additional comment after presenting the A10, which is the second part of uh, of the bill that passed last year on the Senate. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. I'd ask for a roll call too. Th Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. A roll call has been uh, requested. Uh, we'll go to the author, Senator Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just for clarification, I'm only speaking to the A9 right now. Senator Mann, that's correct. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So at this point, I recommend a no vote on the A9 amendment. It deletes uh, the entire bill and replaces it with a uh, insurance program that is done by the private market, which is essentially what we have right now. We have a private run market right now that provides this kind of uh, coverage and 26% of people have it. 26% have access to this kind of leave. Um, this program also only covers certain kinds of leave. It does not cover your own medical condition. It can discriminate based on gender, age, or a pre-existing condition. Um, it has no protections for job loss and the cost of a private program would likely be significantly more than a state one run contributory insurance model. So again, I request a no vote on this amendment, members. Thank you, Senator Mann. Discussion, Senator Liskey. I just wanted to add that we'd like the roll call reported in the journal. Okay, a, a roll call has been requested on the A9 amendment. Roll call will be granted. We have three people asking that it be printed in the journal. It will be. Thank you, Senator Liskey. Um, and do we have further discussion on the A9? Senator Marty. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm not sure what this amendment, other than deleting the bill, I'm not sure what it does. I mean, it seems to me that um, employers already can offer this, and some do. Um, it seems to be we're just saying we don't like the bill, which is okay. You can vote against the bill. I'm just not sure why this is a plus because, uh, again, employers are allowed to do all this already. I'm not sure that insurance companies aren't allowed to offer a product like this already. But um, it doesn't do much. It seems to me that we want to have, you either want to have paid family and medical leave for all workers or not. And I, this would not accomplish anything more than we have now. So I urge your rejection of the amendment. Thank you, Senator Marty. Any further discussion on the A9 amendment? Senator Grunhagen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Marty, for that uh, comment. But I, it is a combination, the A9 and the A10. The A9 lays out some of the benefits as far as the insurance program. The A10 comes back with tax credits and other incentives for the uh, 
for the business to implement a paid family leave. And uh, I think it would, uh, would behoove us to try a private sector solution that might increase a paid family leave dramatically without punishing uh, a one-size-fits-all government program in, uh, as far as the state of Minnesota is concerned and hurting our small businesses at a time when they're trying to recover from the pandemic. I see I, I have the uh, member from the Minnesota Chamber who would like to make an additional comment. If that's okay, Madam Chair. Oh, uh, oh, uh, uh, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator, with regard to the tax credit idea, um, and I don't have a copy of the amendment ahead of or in front of me, but um, when you're talking about an insurance product and some of the issues brought up before, uh, they're already re regulated under anti-discrimination type provisions. So uh, that is one element to be reminded of. Um, also, the option for employers to access this. John had mentioned affordability. Tax credit is a partnership with uh, what's becoming available in the marketplace. It's not currently authorized to be sold in Minnesota. The authorization piece that we've been uh, supporting the past few years is important to point out. So it's an emerging market across the country as this becomes a more attractive benefit. And uh, the provisions within that um, would be unique to those employers, which is true, but the floor that is established under Senate File 2 is well beyond the market and it's expansive and the way that uh, most businesses have currently structured their uh, leave policies around uh, recognized uh, durations of times and uh, definitions of family members and qualifying conditions uh, with the Federal FMLA Act presently. And so it is a more, um, it is a tailored approach that would still be able to achieve this objective. And the combination of the two approaches, I think, is important to recognize when we talk about access and affordability for private sector businesses to offer this on their own without the state mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the A9 amendment? Okay, a roll call has been requested. Would you please take the roll on the A9 amendment? Chair McEwen. No. Hostchild? No. Dornick? Yes. Grunhagen? Yes. Kupak? No. Liskey? Yes. Marty? No. Umover Baton? No. Pappas? No. Wiesenberg? Yes. Four yes votes and six no votes. Thank you. There being um, six no votes and four yes votes, the A9 amendment fails. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to call a recess of our committee at this time. We will reconvene our committee at 515 in this location. Um, Capital Investments Committee has to prepare the room and um, be ready to have their committee in the same space. So uh, I invite any of you who are able to to join us. And members, I will see you at 515 here. Thank you very much. We are recessed. <laughs>